Hi, good evening, all doctors, and thank you very much for having spared your valuable time to be part of today's panel discussion titled "Osteonecrosis of Hip Post-COVID Complications." A very interesting topic which has not been discussed much before. I, Jitender Jindal, Group Product Manager from Juventus Marketing Team, welcome all to today's panel discussion. This is a scientific initiative of Juventus Odinia. which is the pain management wing of juventus healthcare limited working with a motto to alleviate pain and suffering people's lives through brands like myocorp tendofarm setolac transdermal packages like ketoplast diploplast dupleplast to name a few now without taking much of time i would like to introduce the moderator as well as the esteemed panelists of today's discussion we have with us Dr. Shushut Babulkar, who is the moderator of today's discussion. Dr. Shushut Babulkar is the founder member International OTA, that is Orthopedic Trauma Association. He is the president Trauma Society of India, vice president Nails. He is also member task force Lower Limb AO Trauma Regional, and is chief center for joint reconstruction surgery, Shushut Institute of Medical Sciences. based at nagpur amongst the panelists we have dr sc goel with us he is professor and head department of orthopedics heritage institute of medical sciences varanasi he specializes in joint replacement arthroscopy and trauma he is ex professor and head department of orthopedics ims bhu varanasi He is past president Trauma Society of India as well as Indian Orthopedic Association. We also have with us Dr. Swarnendu Sabanta, who is a consultant at PRS Hospital, Kolkata. His areas of interest include pelvic vascular trauma, arthroscopy, arthroplasty. He is associated with AO since 1995 and is also a DNB faculty since 2004. we have with us professor sangeet hawale who is president bombay orthopedic society he is a consultant orthopedic surgeon at saifi jaslok and basia bhati hospital mumbai he is also honorable professor grant medical college and jj group of hospitals mumbai his special interests include complex trauma reconstruction and joints he is faculty at many national conferences and workshops and has many number of publications under his name we also have dr ram manohar reddy with us who is a senior orthopedic consultant continental hospitals hyderabad his special interest is in revision surgery of hips knees and orthoscopic soft tissue surgery of knees he performs primary cemented and uncemented primary hip arthroplasty complex primary knee arthroplasty including all polytibia and rotating platform knee replacement revision knee arthroplasty and revision hip arthroplasty He has many publications in many reputed journals like Rheumatology International and Journal of Arthroplasty. Now I hand over the session to Dr. Sushil Babulkar to please take over. Thank you. Thank you, Jatinder, and thanks Zuventus and Science Integra to put this up. Uh, this is uh, indeed going to be a very uh, uphill task for all us orthopedic surgeons. and physicians of the country uh, to face post covid issues uh, which are related to uh, steroid intake uh, of course uh, those days when we did not have any option but to give uh, steroids to these patients who are in need were in need of steroid at that point in time um, let me uh, welcome all my uh, faculty Uh, starting from uh, beloved uh, professor sc goel sir from varanasi my dear friend swarnendu samanta from kolkata my very dear friend sangeet gawale from mumbai and dr ram mohan reddy from hyderabad 
uh, purposefully i think zwentus has had suggested me to pick up all the faculty from all four corners of the country so that we have a, a nationwide view and opinion as to what we are facing in uh, covid uh, 19 as a part of sequelae of the treatment that our patients underwent of course uh, respiratory was the topmost but uh, second on the list seems to be musculoskeletal followed by cardiovascular neurologic and of course emotional health in musculoskeletal we have seen patients uh, complaining of vague myalgia muscle dysfunction their inability to walk they are easy uh, falling down so prevention of fall was so important for all of us acute exacerbation of joint pains patients who have been rheumatoid earlier or even zero negative arthropathies have suddenly flourished have suddenly manifested and their joint pains have exacerbated clinically as well as symptoms wise osteoporosis osteomalacia and rickets have really thrown uh, the ball completely out of the court lot of patients with uh, fractures are coming their osteoporosis quotient has increased their osteoporosis has increased uh, children are reporting with uh, sudden onset uh, fatigue fractures especially around neck of femur and very obvious they are because of osteomalacia and rickets been flared up because of uh, post covid uh, complication maybe because of uh, they staying home bound maybe as a result of post covid we do not know as yet but post covid post steroid steroids been taken for longer than 3 weeks steroids been abused uh, by some uh, medical non medical practitioners actually have thrown our patients into hip pain leading to osteonecrosis or a vascular necrosis or in uh, non medical terms uh, bone death so that's very very common uh, that's uh, my article which i wrote in american academy of orthopedic surgeons monogram on osteonecrosis uh, so what is osteonecrosis it's a multifactorial heterogeneous group of disorders that leads to a final common pathology of mechanical failure of femoral head and we as doctors with our high index of suspicion clinical acumen and surgical finesse must strive against its progression we will in next panel discussion see how some biological operations can stop the progression of this dreaded disease this was a peer reviewed global monogram which was published by american academy of orthopedic surgeons all science all data based all showing what operations which operations work for what stages of osteonecrosis and we'll talk about it i am lucky to inherit over 50 years of my father's work and his scientific contribution which i continued for last 20 years we have, we have published data we have published in peer reviewed journals we have published books uh, dedicated to osteonecrosis and uh, we will try to look upon some of the conclusions we were also lucky in nagpur to have this belt of sickle cell disease which has given us already knowledge of avascular necrosis which occurs not only in femoral head or hip joint but also in shoulder but why then more in femoral head or hip because we walk on our hips so where are we today in avascular necrosis in the treatment of osteonecrosis how to diagnose it early what are various treatment options biological options and what should be the outcome is what we are going to discuss i am going to stop share and we are going to be uh, discussing all the panelists together so let me uh, start with professor goel uh, professor goel um, in nagpur uh, we have seen uh, around 40 patients now uh, coming uh, post covid some kind of complications can you tell us some experience that uh, you would want to share with us uh, about post covid patients coming with some symptoms yeah uh, we have not seen much of avascular necrosis in these patients yes once i got this information about this uh, today's webinar i asked several of my other friends also 
in Banaras, and uh, they have also not seen any. But uh, uh, some other complication like uh, um, joint pains we have been seeing always, as uh, you also mentioned in the first phase also they were there, joint pains, arthralgias were there. And uh, recently I saw a patient of uh, osteoporosis who without any trauma and without, who was asymptomatic before, got a vertebral collapse and um, cardinal pain after this. So the, even uh, those type of osteo osteoporosis and arthralgias and all are being increased by this disease, this uh, complication of steroid abuse, I think. Okay. Uh, Swadendu, you want to share your experience from Kolkata uh, on post-COVID, uh, any musculoskeletal affection that you have seen, Swadendu? Yeah, yeah, musculoskeletal, like if you uh, consider like most of the patients, those who are COVID, even uh, it is, it is a really been now been known fact that the post COVID that with that classically we tell around like is a long COVID uh, symptoms that uh, starts from the brain, brain fog, depression, and whatever. The musculoskeletal wise, they are talking of the like your generalized bone pain, generalized body ache, and multiple joint pain. And uh, but, but, but to be very frank, Till date, in Kolkata, I have found only two uh, patients, those who are MRI proven, having the uh, your avian hip at stage two. Okay. So, avian, how many avians or how many osteonecrosis of the hip have you seen as yet? As it been for the post-COVID or in my lifetime? Post-COVID, post-COVID, post-COVID. Post COVID, post COVID, I told you that the MRI proven. I have seen only two. Only two. Okay, uh, Doctor Ramon Reddy, uh, what is your Hyderabad experience? Uh, <clears throat> during the COVID times, we have been uh, seeing the avascular necrosis of hips for the last five to six months now, mm -hmm. and uh, they are usually coming after four months of uh, COVID illness and steroid intake. Now the standard, uh, you know, the teaching is if you take 30 milligrams a day for uh, two months, if the cumulative dose is less than, is more than two grams, then the risk is high. But what we have seen is even with nominal doses like 10 milligrams per day for two, three weeks, we are seeing avascular necrosis of the hips. I have seen around 15 to 20 cases so far. Okay. Now operated on three of them for core decompression. Uh, and we'll, we'll, come that. we'll come to that. We'll come to that. Sangeet. Uh, what's your Mumbai experience, Western Maharashtra? Last month, probably we became aware of it. And everybody in the clinic now are seeing with that angle, any symptoms around the knee, around the buttocks, around the back or in the hip, probably we are correlating to that. Mm -hmm. And if he has a history of uh, past COVID and has been, has taken an expected dose as what Dr. Ram has uh, suggested, so he is a suspicious patient. Apart from what you have mentioned, we are getting also patients who have uh, synovitis of the joints, who have muscle atrophy, who have ulcers because of the pressure source and gangrene, of course, uh, because of the peripheral vascular diseases yeah. and thickening of the nerves particularly. Okay. So, so Sangeet, I am going to pin you down for other uh, medical colleagues knowledge because we have a lot of physicians also listening to us and a lot of general practitioners also in addition to orthopedic surgeons. So can you elaborate how confusing this osteonecrosis hip pain can be in terms of its radiation to low back pain or knee pain? So that, uh, you know, the depending on, like we have a stages of avascular necrosis and what we are discussing in this webinar is only the early stage where half the patients will be asymptomatic and only those who have, uh, you know, like they may be symptomatic maybe after three months or four months post COVID where they start with the hip pain or restriction of movement or a lower back or a buttock pain or a trochanter pain or a pain radiating to the thigh or the knee. These are the vague symptoms of these patients. And they're particularly like uh, they have this throbbing pain at night. If they do activities uh, that induces pain. So these are the suspicious patients who probably can be suspected for avascular necrosis symptoms and investigations. Okay. I will just quickly add one uh, 
very good clinical test to it which uh, comes very early in the disease process because osteonecrosis typically affects antero supero lateral portion of the femoral head that becomes extremely sensitive to pain so sectoral deviation test becomes positive so when we typically flex the hip as normally it should go to the opposite side shoulder in avian it tilts more towards the ipsilateral shoulder so that is when antero supero lateral affected portion or going to be affected sensitive portion tries to uh, get in touch with acetabulum and throws itself out that throws the hip out of the socket taking the knee towards the ipsilateral shoulder that becomes a very sensitive uh, test uh, clinical test uh, when we should order mri uh, there is a question for professor goel sir from dr dipali she is asking sir uh, so when this patient of osteoporosis came to you uh, how did you uh, treat the patient and what they should do to avoid osteoporosis of the hip joint and spine as a post covid complication any suggestion i want to ask this question to you so that we can move from osteoporosis and then focus on osteonecrosis after this uh, 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 vitamin d has been uh, given as a treatment in the covid also by people without uh, as i remember in fact uttar pradesh state government had uh, made it mandatory uh, as a protocol uh, and they had taken out a gr Uh, to this effect of vitamin yeah. D. So, yeah. so that way, uh, if you are giving vitamin D and calcium to these patients, probably that will that should take care of this thing. Yeah. Uh, and uh, then we have to see the vulnerable patient. It is it, this patient was sixty seven year. If they are elderly patient, especially those uh, or elderly females also, they should also be they should be given calcium and vitamin D and taken care of. And if they are having any unusual pain. then immediately x ray or mri should be done okay uh, do you also consider doing uh, dexa scan sir bone mineral density for such suspected osteoporotic patient to uh, know whether they are into severe osteoporosis category or not that that, that can be done uh dr reddy a uh, question to you uh, when you saw these patients all your 15 20 patients what was your choice of investigation once you have diagnose patient clinically of suspected osteonecrosis what was your battery of investigations uh, that you did to these patients uh, as a as a clinician the most important uh, step is to do the mri of the pelvis number 1 and the second thing is dexa scan is mandatory if a patient has been treated with steroids it's inevitable that there will be steroid induced osteoporosis if we look at the you know rheumatology society british orthopedic society and all every patient who is on steroids we have to get dexa scan and then decide whether you need to give the medication or not and finally in our country most of the patients uh, you know lack of sunlight because of whatever isolation vegetarian food and all b12 and vitamin d are two other parameters i look into Okay. you have to look at the patient as a whole so these are the four tests which i always include for my patients who are suspected of avm okay uh, sangeet coming back to you i want to bring this uh, topic of mri so if a patient calls me that uh, look doctor i am post covid now 3 months i have recovered completely out of post covid but i know i was given steroids during uh, the treatment because that was Uh, inevitable to save my life otherwise i would have died so that point in time my treating physician gave me steroid i do not know what dose but this is my prescription should i do mri sir what would you advise sangeet um, now this this is in continuation of what you have asked the other faculty and what was the what relevant investigation would you advise sure. now a uh, patient who is coming with a hip pain or around the hip and he has uh, restricted internal rotation on flexion as you described x rays uh, definitely be advised to all they are normal so your symptoms are not matching with the normal radiological x rays so these are the one who should go should be suspect uh, should be subjected for a higher investigation apart from that who are the who are the category like uh, 
those who have high cholesterol high lipidemic stage who have hemoglobinopathies who are uh, uh, who are alcoholic probably that is another category in which i would definitely advise the mri okay uh, swarnendu mri x ray we have already talked of but for academic interest so that people should understand and know what are the other investigations that we have been doing for osteonecrosis because we as orthopedic surgeons know that this is not a new disease we have been seeing osteonecrosis or avascular necrosis since uh, time immortal since we got trained so what were the theoretical investigations which have been written in the books of course less practical value today with advent of mri no no i think i think uh, as because we are we are taking the mri mri is the most sensitive diagnostic tool for picking picking up this uh, uh, type 1 and type 2 picker and all okay so you don't need any fancy sort of other investigations only thing is that you have to rule out i completely agree with my dear friend sangeet that you are not missing any of the comorbid medical issues like your hypercholesteremia you are not missing out the hyper hypovita hypovitamin d3 and hemoglobinopathies and sickle cell all this and alcohol abuse and also the tobacco so these are the six common things that if you are finding this with your clinical picture and if the guy is i told you properly this most important point is that if he is telling that pointing that anterior hip point and he is Uh, not happy with your ADL, he cannot squat, and he is uh, really bothered about his hip. Then only I will be going ahead with the uh, MRI only. I don't advise any other DEXA and all this fancy investigation just to supplement my diagnosis of the AV and hip. This is not absolutely necessary. Absolutely, these are unnecessary tests. Correct. Good. Good point driven in. Uh, go ahead, sir. A lot of classifications have been described. What are uh, the use of all these? Uh, classifications like picket arlet na king arco uh, what does it uh, tell me as a doctor or uh, to explain the patient what does it tell uh, the patient as the severity of the disease sir yeah because uh, they, they they tell us the extent of the involvement most of these classification the picket arlet is the most common being used and we all follow that um, but arco also but they they are telling us what is the extent and whether it uh, if it is grade 1 and 2 then probably we can salvage that hip and if it is gone beyond 3 then probably this hip will need a replacement type of surgery that uh, that is where they help us okay yeah good so uh, so basically for knowledge of uh, the audience uh, there are stages the disease will go it will directly not lead to stage of complete destruction which is the stage of arthritis or stage 4 but it will go from stage 0 to 1 to 3 to 4 so typically stage 0 is a completely silent clinically asymptomatic hip to stage 1 which is uh, mri changes x ray normal to stage 4 which is stage of arthritis coming back to dr ram mohan reddy uh, you were uh, giving us a glimpse of some biological operations that you did so what are the options that you will tell the patient who has come to you early in the whole process of this uh, stage 1 to business so what are your options like what do you consider yeah my in uh, avn before the head collapses uh, there are, there are basically three uh, procedures which i discuss with the patient one is a simple core decompression of the hip a uh, second one is a uh, fibular grafting and the third one is uh, the muscle uh, pedicle grafting of which the commonest one which i offer and say the evidence is is basically the core decompression so what evidence uh, would you give the patient sir so let's say uh, hypothetically there is a, a 35 year old gentleman coming to you post covid post steroid stage 2 disease uh, some changes on x ray have already started mri is showing changes but there is no collapse of the femoral head so crescent sign has yet not appeared yeah uh, with core decompression of the hip uh, what i explain to the patient is number one is pain relief to reduce the intraosseous pressure that's the number one uh, target for us pain relief the second is to restore the vascularity and the third thing is to prevent the collapse of the femoral head which we 
support with biphosphonates. In general, with evidence we have, I would say in the region of 50 to 60 percent, we can prevent further collapse and arthritis of the hips. Okay, can you quote me that evidence? What? what? Yeah, uh, if we go back to the JBJS article somewhere between 2000 and 2002, there's a very good current concepts article by Dr. Hungerford. David Hungerford. Where he has discussed avian hips in great detail, a very good landmark paper, and it is available online. You know, it's yeah. easily downloadable. So, core decompression and fibular grafting is your favorite uh, in early stages pre collapse. Before collapse, mainly core decompression. Mm -hmm. Fibular uh, grafting in general, I don't do, but it is multiple drill holes with biphosphonates. And uh, in the last seven years, I've seen good results where we are not. Sangeet, you wanted to suggest yeah. something? So the last, uh, you are asking about the evidence. Yes. Uh, so the last and a very good evidence is of uh, 32 studies, meta-analysis of 32 studies, where the survival for five years, where core decompression has been done, is almost up to 65%. Okay. okay. So uh, the surgery is not that great. That patient should be scared of or it requires a multiple uh, large exposure. So basically it's a single two, three stitch surgery, smaller surgery where an incision is a half an inch and we are doing a core decompression. That means drilling the necrosed area and the patient is discharged next day. Against that, patient is not losing anything. There are no known complications. So if he is lucky, he may fall in that 65% category where his hip can survive and from the evidence the survival rate is almost up to uh, uh, five for five years is up to 65 percent now all these studies are for normal avascular necrosis where the causes are not known and our webinar probably what we are discussing is post covid so that study whether it will be uh, helpful to us or whether it is the same type of avascular necrosis we still don't know Yet. No, no one knows Sangeet, but we know that it is post-COVID, post-steroid. So we can extrapolate our post-steroid avascular ne necrosis knowledge to here is uh, what we think. Right. So if that it has worked in that category, it should work in this category as well. That is what we can drive a conclusion. Okay. So I'm going to uh, pitch you against completely non-surgical treatment. So if you are treating stage one, patient or stage two patient, why not treat them only with bisphosphonates or only with some pharmacological agents? Uh, yeah. 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 Go ahead, sir. You wanted to say something? Yeah. Yes. Uh, I was coming to this thing only. Uh, earlier, we have been doing uh, for decompression and I have put uh, even uh, uh, this, uh, stem cells in that and fibula. But last time, uh, Sanjay Agarwala from Bombay Hospital published an article uh, on bisphosphonal treatment. And since then, for the last 10 years, I have not done any core decompression. All grade 1, 2, I have been treating with bisphosphonates only. And uh, they all have survived. They, they have increased. Pain has gone and they are on full move. The only thing, along with this fast period, they were women's were they, their weight bearing was restricted for about a year. Sangeet, so you have something to say against yeah. this now? Yeah. yeah. Now, yeah. Uh, <laughs> sure. sure. Many now, will as, <laughs> yeah. As regards the conservative treatment, as you said, where the area of the head is inferior quadrant as against a superior quadrant, mm -hmm. where it is in a non weight bearing area, we see a vascular necrosis, very few cases. They are the one which can be conserved. As regards the alternative treatment, levodopa, vasodilators, then um, alendronate. So these drugs have been tried. But uh, as against what is practiced is bisphosphonate. It is controversial. There is no definitive recommendation. And uh, what is a therapeutic dose, it is not known to anybody still yet. But still we are giving for whatever uh, benefit it may give to that patient and also there are uh, individuals there are surgeons or physicians who are giving hyperbaric oxygen extracorporeal uh, shock wave therapy or pulse uh, that magnetic pulse therapy 
so they have also been tried but uh, all have i mean there are various studies if we have good studies they are against that also but these are the alternative treatment uh, those drugs and these treatment which can be practiced for those who are not uh, considering core decompression surgery okay uh, goel sir i am going to ask you a question i don't know if uh, this is a relevant question stage 1 of avascular necrosis or osteonecrosis we know that in the contained femoral head the pressure is increasing because that's been aptly shown by uh, ficat arlet by doing functional bone marrow investigation that the pressure increases and what core decompression does is only decompression of that compartment syndrome like situation so as to stimulate bone formation and avoid uh, the cycling or the uh, pathway been set up for uh, continued osteonecrosis to happen in that weight bearing portion as sangeet aptly described how can only bisphosphonate probably save that uh, coronary artery kind of a situation uh, in stage 1 i am talking once the crescent sign appears stage 2 uh, it gets decompressed and we will see a transition phase that stage 1 very painful hip stage 2 painful hip crescent sign x ray turns bad but the pain disappears for some time and stage 4 again pain will reappear because of arthritic changes so i am talking of stage 1 when pain is excruciating patient is howling of pain and we are thinking of non surgical bisphosphonates how do you think it will work sir i am not sure <laughs> it was because it came in that article so we started yeah. using that and uh, Uh, so then if these phosphonates are going to only trigger better uh, circulation if that's the hypothesis yes. then can we not do what sangeet or what uh, dr reddy is suggesting and uh, do core decompression do fibular bone grafting and also give these phosphonates to that have an add added uh, mutually beneficial synergistic effect on uh, of both things yes that may be uh let's let's move on to a more biological operation which i think is more biology which has been published uh, widely practiced widely in eastern part of our country kolkata and swarnendu i want you to talk about professor dp bakshi whom i uh, have uh, great um, i have great admiration for uh, of course all bengalis i love you know that uh, especially <laughs> mr dahi uh, but swarnendu tell me about Uh, your experience on tfl muscle pedicle bone grafting and how you will consider doing it which stages you will consider do it and till what stages you will uh, keep on uh, doing it swarnendu yes we all we have, we have got probably the highest regard from one of the real genius in this part of the world uh, professor boxy and he has uh, done uh, the muscle pedicle bone graft by your you know that is a tensor fasciae cell later tfl and the also the quadratus femoris also okay and if we have we all read this jbj article and the all international publications even the last article if you read is more than 100 cases and his recommendation is that whenever you do either you do the tfl or the muscle pedicle quadratus femoris you do in up to stage 3 and in in case series in more than 100 cases believe me 30% of the cases in this whole series was steroid induced induced ficat early stage 2 even he has tried in stage 3 but the long term outcome after 5 years of all those cases in stage 3 disease and also this has been in one study in the chinese group probably i forgot the name might be dr chen he has also done the same procedure as professor boxy's article wise and his feeling was also for the stage three disease with the muscle pedicle bone graft after 5 years is not satisfactory to be very frank it is poor so it is better to try with your stage two disease and your result in that with professor boxy's techniques is really good up to stage two i completely agree with that article and i don't uh, i don't think nobody in this panel will do this muscle pedicle bone graft in stage uh, 3 disease only so other unless another boy do in stage 3 then stage unless 
Stage four, we agree that uh, total hip replacement is. That's why. That's why. That's why. Last I told you only that means when you go with with the muscle pedicle bone graft with your this then you have to go ahead with your chelectomy. You have to uh, you have to take out this necrotic fragment. Yeah. You have to do something. You have to address that, and then only you can add on your muscle pedicle. But to be muscle pedicle as a singular procedure, I think that is advisable from these boxes and all the international article is up to stage two again. my question to you swarnendu you is uh, which is one of the criticisms uh, on uh, professor dp bakshi's uh, procedure is it comes in the way of future hip replacement because it will change some anatomy in that region it will uh, it's a major procedure it's a major do long incision uh, does it do that yeah yeah it is that there is always a debate because if you do something like your muscle pedicle bone graft with a big incision is lot of fibrosis is there but uh, you have to you have to consider that uh, obviously that dissection plane changes for your hip hip replacement okay but i think uh, even there, there, there is a debate whatever you do the redo the your uh, tkias in the high hto it is i don't know all though that it is a difficult scenario but uh, but now there is lot lot many other approaches are still there if we go from the back side still we can i think sangeet will be definitely doing with the uh, modified hardinge you will be definitely doing with the modern mod modified hardinge i think there is a bail out for that it is not the criticism that i obviously we all agree that there is change in the muscle plane and change in the fibrosis but still we can bail out uh, the situation by the other approaches we do sangeet what's your favorite uh, biological operation see the issue is i have greatest respect for dr bakshi but here we don't know uh, probably the era was pre mri where we uh, only the x rays were considered that was one second is uh, you know like a core decompression is a part of muscle pedicle and now if you see the vascular anatomy of the head the epiphyseal link Uh, which is the superior retinacular artery which is blocked in the subchondral bone which is uh, and that gives rise to avascular necrosis in that sector of the femoral head and where we are putting the pedicle in the neck a muscle pedicle in the neck so how that is going to help i still i have not understood that part so where your pathology is superior and you are putting a pedicle at the level of neck which is almost a inch and inch and half away from that area so how that is going to work i still don't know uh, the mechanism no, 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 sangeet sangeet the problem let, let me complete second the surgery what is described it is not reproducible by many of us so that is the practical difficulty and still like you ask me question what is the biological procedure now uh, there are other two procedures apart from core decompression the trap door and uh, a light bulb procedure wherein in one we dislocate the hip uh, raise the flap remove the subchondral necros bone and put a graft and third is like uh, through the neck we try to curate it out the necros part of the uh, area and put pack it with the graft and the third one probably the fibular graft which again which we used to do but we have stopped practicing it you did not listen to my question sangeet i ask you what is your favorite tell me one answer i have not this and i have i have stopped fibular graft i used to do about maybe 8 or 9 years back uh, uh, the other two procedures my experience is hardly 3 or 4 cases each where in which in one i have dislocated the hip and then raised the flap and packed it with a graft but the results were not that encouraging of the other two but to me uh, either co decompression if they agree otherwise leave it alone till they develop more symptoms and they are ready for uh, hip replacement, hip replacement. so what and you wanted to uh, come back no no i i was telling because because sangeet was asking how this muscle pedicle go, uh, graft is going to help in the uh, the uh, revascularization whatever because you see this is a Uh, this is the basic common theory what wherever we put the muscle pedicle bone graft the 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 bone bone which is supplied by that sort of muscle it is put in that groove and this is going to give some supply this this we follow in the other regions too suppose what a suppose for a scaphoid neck you just put a small uh, bone chip with a small muscle uh, pedicle with that 
so it is not the question how much blood is going to that area because if we read the bakshi's article the follow up was really long it was like um, 16.5 years 16 and a half years of time and the success rate for one and two it was like nearly 83% so far i remember mm -hmm. so it is a, not the question and i do agree with my dear friend sangeet that it is not been reproducible by most of the surgeons that's why it was not very popular by uh, in mo most of the places if you consider out of india even the there are a lot many critics in us even in the in live meeting with uh, you know with professor ranavat in one meeting in jaipur uh, in the stage with professor bakshi and ranavat they were completely in north pole and south pole whether this muscle pedicle really works in non union femur or not okay so we uh, there are uh, still the proponents are there for the non union neck femur i think sangeet will never do the muscle pedicle bone graft for a frank non union i completely agree with sangeet that i am also not going to do a, a muscle pedicle bone graft for my non union femurs rather i will do something else but for the theoretical aspect for the ficadarle 1 and 2 still i will favor that pedicle bone graft but boxes are suggested with a long follow up like 16 by 5 years with 83% of success rate if somebody can replicate that still it is advisable it is not the question of how much vascular is going here for now goel sir you wanted to say something please yeah. ji uh, in my practice all the over the years uh, somehow in varanasi we have not seen many avians otherwise also post covid is now we have seen quite a few but not too many but i have been doing muscle pedicle bone grafting for non union fracture neck femur and what sangeet's question was when i put that graft i put a gout into the head and burrow a make a hole there in the head and i hammer my graft into that my technique is little different from dr bakshi and so that graft is going into the head and so probably that might be the thing which help in uh, avian but for neck femur non union also i have been doing that i did about 260 cases and majority of them sartorius based graft from anterior side so that might be way because we can uh, decompress the head also from that same approach and put the graft there and that might have helped but i don't have much experience of the avian uh, muscle graft bone grafting in yes doctor reddy i take it that uh, you are not doing any muscle pedicle at all and uh, no dr shishrat uh, one thing here is covid is a totally different situation where we have we are giving lot of steroids now if the steroids have caused avascular necrosis of the hip it should definitely be affecting the blood supply to the muscles whatever muscle pedicle you take whether it is the mpg or the tfl or the sartorius so uh, my concern is the blood vessels which are supplying these muscles are they good or they also steroid affected so will it really help to do the mpg in covid cases so that puts me off the mpg procedures for covid cases related avian so i totally follow what dr sangeet said either i do a core decompression or i don't do anything else okay uh any other uh, surgeries anyone else amongst the faculty suggesting like vascularized uh, pedicle grafting sangeet you seem to be nodding your head you so that, there are other two things which are uh, you know the patient they come up with this uh, since it is available on the google uh, vascularized fibula one and the stem cell like after a core decoration uh, in that sector you inject the stem cells yes i have no experience of both of these do you believe in that so, so I, i agree uh, uh, no experience but do you believe in that is the question i am yet yet to be convinced with the literature uh, about the results all right swadendu yes yes completely agreed with uh, uh, with sangeet uh, but that we are we are really, really not been convinced of putting stem cells into that the i i have i have seen in in my hospital one of my colleague uh, after core de decompression he is just aspirating from the iliac crest and putting putting that in the holes and even i when in a personal meeting with uh, uh, dr gauri neni you know that guy he is completely hip guy and he was asking for the same thing to put some he was asking for the prp so i think uh, these are all very uh, mischievous solutions to be given i think the core de decompression is doing the trick even people are asking for putting zoledronic acid through the holes so i don't agree on that 
I I just do the code decompression, do two stitches like Sangi and forget. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So probably so that we all agree. Uh, core decompression is a golden standard yeah. for those pre-collapse stage. So shall I quickly wrap up and then I will come back to panel again? Yes. Okay. You are the boss. Whatever you think. No, no, no. I am not the boss. You are the boss, Sonindu. <laughs> okay. So where are we today? Was the question we asked, and we were kind of looking at crescent sign. this is the crescent sign once it appears then the future collapse is inevitable pain can be anywhere and this is the sectoral deviation test which i was talking to you about the moment you flex the hip it will go towards ipsilateral shoulder and that was that is sugioka himself uh, who had come to nagpur and uh, hardikar sir gs kulkarni sir young days even i was looking young that time uh, so of course uh in diagnosis uh, it can range from doing a plain x ray to isotope bone scan to mri mri continues to be the standard of the goal various classifications have been described uh, but of course arco classification which takes it from 0 to stage 4 is the standard today uh, x ray the basic uh, test bone scan used to, we used to do Uh, it will show the bulb uh, lighting up suddenly on the swelling uh, or the inflammatory phase mri t1 t2 im uh, weighted images will typically show that double line sign mri has a high specificity high sensitivity high spatial resolution so continues to be the uh, standard of uh, diagnosis today management will start uh, range and we will consider the age whether the disease is unilateral bilateral etiology demand and need of the patient and of course the stage and of course as sangeet has vividly described we have to look at the other associated uh, etiology if at all patient is presenting and various head preserving surgeries uh, have been uh, talked about these are some of our experiences core decompression alone with free fibula muscle pedicle vascularis grafts and some of the things which we have not tried is electrical stimulation and hip dislocation and curettage we have not tried core decompression and bone grafting i think is uh, one of the best solutions that's uh, the hip which is been uh, shown stage 1 uh, 2 disease mri positive x ray almost negative core decompression that's 3 months down the line fibula attacking the antero supero lateral portion in the uh, in the lateral so lateral you have to direct your fibula to the base of uh, base of the uh, triangle so that uh, it uh, makes the triangle not collapse further so fibula will touch the uh, apex of the triangle Uh, which is the antero superior lateral triangle and then it will not collapse further muscle pedicle uh, we have some experience with tensor fascial atta graft and we think it works that's a stage 2 uh, on one side stage 3 on the other side uh, sickle cell that's a position on table uh, lateral incision uh, that's how tfl is uh, exposed iliac crest osteotomy done lesion exposed lesion curated and then you push in the tfl graft inside uh, as such it is again directed towards under image intensifier towards the triangular area which is collapsing and it supports the triangle on the lateral it supports the triangle uh, at the apex so that there is no collapse mechanical collapse steroid induced bilateral osteonecrosis a uh, lot of patients uh, that's stage 3 on one side stage 1 on the other side which stage 1 uh, received core decompression and fibula graft stage 3 received again curettage of the lesion identifying the lesion identifying the triangle and tensor fascia lata graft that's one and half years down the line complete incorporation of tensor fascia lata graft there is no further collapse in fact there is an attempt towards even the revascularization of the uh, sector that was involved uh, so that's absolutely magic it is no way going to come in the way of your future total hip replacement that's 4 years down the line 
so th- that's four years down the line and that's nine years down the line core decompression complete absorption of uh, fibula graft on one side complete resorption of the uh, thing and in fact the contour of the femoral head as you can see on the dunce view is maintained even after nine years that's another example post steroid bilateral avn that's after 17 months of both sides have undergone tfl bone grafting and that's if you see 17 months x ray that's where we harvested from the iliac crest the graft so this is uh, sangeet mri days i have done this patient so uh, and published it uh, also uh if you uh, remember few years back i won the silver jubilee uh, medal for this work of mine which was vascularized pedicle iliac crest graft so we do angiography uh, of this patient that's where we flip the graft from based on this deep circumflex iliac artery uh, very simple operation you don't need a microvascular or a surgeon or a microscope for this so that's an example of a scientist uh, based out of hyderabad Uh, stage one on the left side, stage zero on the other side. MRI was positive on both the sides. Uh, wife, a doctor. Uh, that's the operative incision, pre-operative angiography. On one side, we did core decompression, fibula graft. On the other side, I did vascularized iliac crest. Look how beautifully it gets incorporated. Three years down the line, seven year down the line. no huge collapse of course it will collapse of course it will progress but that seven years down the line vascular is iliac crest seems to be working so well and good range of motion that's 10 years down the line we wrote it up we wrote it up this article uh, density is increased sclerosis has increased but the contour is maintained patient continues to be asymptomatic patient doesn't want any conversion another patient uh, of vascular is iliac crest 3 years down the line free fibula on the other side that's 14 years down the line of course now it has collapsed but still patient typically indian patients some of them don't want conversion to total hip they are happy with the range of motion they have they are happy with minimalistic pain that they have that's 20 years down the line on one side fibula, free fibula core decompression and on the other side vascularized iliac crest harvested from this iliac crest and put in there not a gross collapse not a gross uh, derangement of the femoral head osteotomy uh, i think it's one operation which is very difficult to predict outcome of technically difficult to reproduce it will change the future arthroplasty of course once stage 4 arthroplasty is the way to go but there we must remember young patients are there they will continue uh, some of them use of steroids they have very high level ac- activity so recent trend is more towards biological operations uh, we have talked about stem cells uh, restricted reserved views we have talked about uh, putting them in we have various techniques have been employed Uh, people also in literature have talked about biophysical stimulation for avn i have not used it i don't know the results if they are predictable or not inference early detection is important clinical along with mri seems to be uh, a good way to go about it core decompression with bone grafting is preferred without grafting limited value uh, i think tfl bone grafting and more so vascularized iliac crest bone grafting especially for stage 2 and stage 3 seems to be the way to go osteotomies some of them are good in designers hands very difficult to predict the outcome but definitely will hinder in future arthroplasty so for all pre collapse hips or early post collapse vascular iliac crest seems to be the choice of uh, the day uh, probably so if i have to conclude if there is no crescent sign or no collapse core decompression bone grafting if crescent sign early collapse vascular pedicle or muscle pedicle collapse may be rotational osteotomy but one stage four replacement of the hip so i think uh, i tried to sum up 
what all we had to say any difference of opinion there anyone can just pick up the mic and speak goel sir no. i think you summarized well swarnendu any suggestion yeah, I, i think i think i think uh, those who are listening even pre- you told that some medical people are also listening to our uh, meeting mm-hmm. i think this is the protocol because this is a very simple classification like once there is a once the, 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 to be better understanding for the people those or non orthopedic people are listening to the meeting once the sphericity the round shadow of the head is gone then the conservative sort of operations are not going to work so if you remember this simple line i think this will be remember for lifetime once the sphericity is there still you can do some sort of bypass operations like your core decompression and your uh, b- b- uh, your muscle pedicle and whatever but once the sphericity that is crescent sign and the uh, your sequestrum is there or the arthritic chain is the only acetabular side is there then you have to go with the thr and this this way is i think this is the best way to remember yes, yes, yes. sangeet sangeet yes so so probably it's confusing because each of us have used different classification so put it simple uh, pre collapse where as swarnendu has said the head has not collapsed either you can conserve or operate with the procedures what you have described these are conservative procedures yeah. non invasive procedures second is a stage of collapse where uh you can again wait or operate and third is a stage of osteoarthritis where we have to consider replacement surgery so that is in a nutshell treatment of avascular necrosis in the stages dr ram reddy you want to add something to this oh, i agree with the dr sangeet uh, yes i have summarized it in three simple statements before collapse and after collapse conservative procedures or replacement yeah so uh to summarize again everything before collapse and after collapse before collapse of course try to give some biological operation to your patient and make sure that you save the femoral head because these are young patients they are high demand patients total hip replacement will not give you that result in pre collapse stage and it's not required in collapse you again divide into two parts collapse but no arthritic changes you can still try and curate the lesion and give some biological operation like muscle pedicle bone grafting but collapse and arthritic changes which swarnendu suggested loss of sphericity roundness of femoral head and arthritic changes on the acetabulum or the uh, covering side is there we have to consider total hip replacement to give pain relief and good range of motion with this we end this panel discussion on post covid and post sangeet you want to say something please uh, you have asked question it is now yes. our duty to ask your question and sum up oh. for everybody yes, yes. absolutely Basically, i have written down five questions yes go summarizes on. everything because some of them are non orthopedic yeah. so who are the suspect of a vascular necrosis okay the suspect can i, can I, I think can i answer so so yes one in the go ahead answer we are summing up don't go in details no no, no, no. i think i think if if the whole prednisolone dose remember this is the i think this is a very simple line to remember if the whole prednisolone dose is more than 3 g he is a great suspect uh yes. nendu i am coming to steroid later but my question to shushul is who are the suspect to general orthopedic surgeon and physicians i think the answer is very simple for general orthopedic surgeons pre covid we have seen in these sequences post steroid number 1 post alcohol number 2 some etiology like sickle cell disease or gouchers number 3 and idiopathic has been last in the list today with post covid and with use of steroid any patient who has history of uh, post covid and who has history of been given prescribed doses of steroid any dosage is a suspect uh, is a candidate of a uh, high index of suspicion excellent just to add uh, uh, like your s- clinical symptoms and signs are not matching he has excruciating pain x rays are normal these are the one who are co- who are coming to you with a hip pain and uh, uh, second part is those who have comorbidities which you have mentioned in your slide so these are the one who are the suspect 
past three or six months of COVID, okay. you should suspect them for investigation. Okay. What is your investigation of choice? Is the second question. Uh, my investigation of choice, of course, I will answer that. But before that, I want to tell you, I received two patients who have been treated for low back pain for six months for acute PID. They underwent MRI also of lumbosacral spine, but. Uh, my dear colleague never bothered to extend that MRI to the hips and his examination to the hips. So my message is even with low back pain complaining young patients post COVID, we must also examine the next joint distal to it, which is the hip. And if you are doing the uh, MRI of the spine, just quick screen your hips, you will not miss it. So my that brings answer to my second question. What's the investigation of choice? Clinical suspicion, sectoral deviation test, and MRI is the choices investigation. So that message is very clear. Third question: What are the non-operative procedures? Sum up, like uh, medical medical drugs. Surgeon, surgeon wants to each for surgery, but of course, if it is stage one on one side, stage zero on other side, which is MRI positive but clinically still asymptomatic, those kind of patients. Even those patients will come to us, which I have uh, some of them that they are post COVID. Now they have listened to a lot of my talks uh, everywhere. Google is talking of osteonecrosis. They come to uh, us with MRI. We have not advocated, but they came, came with MRI. MRI report saying that osteonecrosis in both the hips, but clinically they are asymptomatic, no symptoms at all. What should we be, uh, be doing? Should we operate on them? No, we can. Uh, cautiously wait, keep them under observation, start bisphosphonates. These are the patients who are asymptomatic clinically, MRI positive, give them, uh, get their B12 and D3 done, give them uh, vitamin D and give them bisphosphonates, but keep their very religious, very scrupulous, very uh, critical uh, clinical examination and follow up. So to sum up, uh, non-operative procedures, if you want to follow bisphosphonate, vitamin D3, calcium, non-weight bearing, anything else, all the other things, hyperbaric oxygen has also been described, shockwave therapy, extracorporeal shockwave therapy and physiotherapy is the non-operative treatment. Uh, choice of operative treatment, choice of operative treatment, which is suitable to all. I think suitable to all is core decompression bone grafting. See, right. only doing core decompression, one single hole uh, and keeping it empty, you are asking for mechanical failure or iatrogenic fracture there because right. it has to be so big so as to decompress your femoral head. Right. So multiple holes, no use. Single hole, leaving it alone, no use. So we have to also add mechanics to it in terms of fibular grafting. It can be uh, patient's own. Uh, fibula, you don't lose anything because you can harvest half of it and uh, get away from the morbidity of fibular grafting or uh, uh, extract three fourth of it. But core decompression bone grafting is the way to go. Almost reproducible, uh, great results in stage one and stage two. My personal choice, learn uh, Professor Buxy's very simple, I think reproducible TFL bone grafting. It's useful for stage three because we need to add biology in stage three to avoid and buy some more years for these young patients who are otherwise going to have inevitable collapse and early approach to stage four expensive surgery uh, of uh, total hip replacement. So here we differ, the faculty differs. 50% of us agree for only core decompression which is almost 65% uh, giving a good result from the available literature as against the other alternative procedures like uh, fibular graft or a muscle pedicle bone graft. Half of us also agree and we are doing that. Now the last question, if you want to advise to the physician, what is a safe dose of steroid and how it should be given? We are not uh, the authority, but from the perspective of avascular necrosis. If we have to advise, the question is to all of us, what is the optimum dose or what is the dose they should curtail to so that the patient do not get 
or they do not have a risk of avascular necrosis so, so, which one of these so should can i take this because this is a medical issue i uh, just uh, read few lines on that okay, you so, you take this and then i will talk of my experience also so what yeah, do you do first yeah yeah the, because if you go to the all literatures they are telling like if you if, if your cumulative dose of because whatever like dexamethasone solomedrol whatever you give you have to ultimately there is a conversion ratio to prednisolone okay sangeet so if you just whatever dexamethasone solomedrol you convert it to prednisolone dose the literature is like if your cumulative dose is more than 3 g then the chance of avian is less if it is more than 3 g cumulative then it is more but if you can read the other articles like uh, our friend uh, sanjay's article from hinduja and also one article from kerala these are all case reports they are they are the three cases are one they got in 750 was the minimum prednisolone dose for that they got in the very early stage the the average was 58 days and 57 days so it was less than two months so cumulative dose is not like whatever it it's so many multi multifactorial things are there it is very difficult to prove even they are now telling the the ace protein whatever is joining with this a uh, corona virus spike one so that is also one indicator other people are susceptible for the, this thing so i think according to this article if we even cross like 750 prednisolone at the end of two months you might get that but theoretically according to the literature is is a 3 g of uh, prednisolone is the critical dose okay so i will take this further so what i do and i will say something else ashushrut yeah. dr ram has said 2000 mg 2 g Uh, and swarnendu is saying 3 g there is a significant difference now uh, yes. dr ram can you explain that yeah the dose which i mentioned is from the research articles where probably covid was never you know <laughs> imagine that it would happen now the problem with covid is without steroids itself there is vasculitis of the peripheral limbs if there is vasculitis of the peripheral limbs it is going to affect the hips as well with or without steroids the risk of avian is going to be high with this virus you know the spike protein or the ac protein and all so that 2 grams which i mentioned probably doesn't you probably you cannot extrapolate that dose here i have seen patients in the last 6 months with doses of 10 mg per day just for one month they have come with avian hips that's less than a cumulative dose of 1 gram it is a bit concerning very much concerning now 2 grams 3 grams and all i think is immaterial it <laughs> there are so many other factors involved here because uh, that experience is from that sars earlier yes. from yes. 2003 to 15 these are the research paper which have concluded that what sarnendu has said is exactly true 750 uh, mg to 2 grams yeah. is the uh, cumulative dose required to have a avian uh, shushrut okay now i am going to stand by all our physician colleagues uh see we were in a situation and i have myself run a covid dedicated center where we were compelled to give steroids to the dying patient otherwise the patient would have died so that point in time giving steroid was mandatory to save life of the patient how much of that has resulted into osteonecrosis not all but there were also a select category of patients who received steroids only will get osteonecrosis now as rightly suggested by dr uh, ram there are patients who have thrown emboli so those typical patients who have thrown emboli have also resulted into osteonecrosis so that is a mixed picture of macroembolization and they receiving steroids also have resulted 100% into steroid that group we should have extremely high suspicion of index okay um, so now how much dose is really uh, of uh, numerical significance no one knows no one in the world knows because pre covid was a different category of patients post covid covid disease by itself its ability to throw microemboli which has been seen in cardiac uh, manifesting patients which we have seen also in patients with osteonecrosis 
of course any amount of steroid more than 3 weeks has significantly resulted into osteonecrosis the numerical dosage is not of importance but if it's a long covid long duration of treatment long steroid has resulted into osteonecrosis and should be the patients wherein we should have that high index of suspicion sangeet uh, beautifully you have sum up so only thing is like what you have said is absolutely right only those who are in those ards symptoms okay they should be given uh, the required amount of st uh, steroid as they are uh, correct so let me let, let me put a stop and subsequently the trend is like uh, as you earlier said at the beginning abuse patients are being continued for months and months with steroid even though they have come out of that even of they have recovered from that critical illness still they are being continued so what so people that, did uh, in, second wave, uh, in second wave what people did at day one of admission they put the patient on steroids that should not have been done day one patient reporting to opd patients have put them on steroid that should not have been done so rightly only patients who are not responding to uh, remdesivir or patients who landed with respiratory distress asthma ards should have been given steroids so now people uh, or the authority and who also has taken steroid away from the normal protocol so today's protocol of the third wave if at all it comes to india does not include steroid as a mainstay of the treatment it is to be given only if required to those respiratory distress patients or to those non responding patients of a conventional covid treatment swanendu for a limited yes. time and it should not be continued beyond that for a longer period yes swanendu so i think i think i, I think susrut if if at all the third wave is coming and we are really concerned about the steroid induced this thing they have the icmr and the aims they have given a very very beautiful criteria when to give the steroid yes if if there is hypoxia increasing crp d dimers il6 all these categories are there only you start with the either with the dexamethasone or with the solumedrol and that to for 3 to 5 days once the critical phase is over then only yeah. you come down to your oral oral steroid for 10 to 15 days hardly so i completely agree that so that you don't cross the cross that critical dose at critical time of 3 weeks time so if you are just rampantly for the milder disease those who are in the home isolation just the for the sake of safety you are prescribing you are not following the icmr or the aims guideline so if you follow the aims cbid guideline nobody is going to prescribe the dexamethasone solumedrol or the or the tablets yes and i am sure these guidelines will keep evolving and keep changing okay. as we will realize the science of uh, what we are facing which is Uh, the covid and the new variants that uh, are um, attacking the human mankind uh, so thank you very much which brings us to the end of this panel discussion thank you very much all the panelists and all my good friends uh, professor goel thank you very much from varanasi to join in swarnendu thanks from kolkata sangeet gawale thank you very much to join from mumbai and dr ram mohan reddy thank you very much to join in from hyderabad i really thank uh, zuventus to Uh, scientifically back us up and i thank science integra uh, to put all this together i uh, thank you all and wish you goodbye and take care and stay safe thank you bye bye